I must tell you, my friends, that the good news that you have heard me preach was no human invention. I didn't take it over from any man, but I heard it directly as a revelation from Jesus Christ. It's a typical blast from one of Paul's missionary letters, the oldest Christian documents in the world. And the letters seem authentic enough, too. In the last hundred years, archaeologists have dug up all sorts of circumstantial detail that Paul mentions in his letters. And the style, too, is exactly right. Exactly right for a Roman letter of that period, with one essential difference. Paul's vigorousness has actually twisted the rather elegant classical form into a sort of unique tirade, because the man's got a message. He's, in fact, got the first Christian message to the West. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Paul and the Apostles took their message to almost every town of the Roman Empire, and certainly to here, the suburb of Herculaneum in the shadow of Vesuvius. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I may have faith strong enough to move mountains, but if I have no love, I am nothing. There is nothing love cannot face, no limit to its faith, its hope, its endurance. Well, this hardly looks like a tired and hungry world searching for a new faith. as the Christian explanation of how their religion managed to conquer the Roman Empire so often goes. And this is a house from St Paul's time, urban Italy, house of a small merchant. It's got enough money to get in Greek mosaic artists, nice fresco painters. This is a little courtyard. You couldn't afford much room in a town, but you could fill it full of goodies. And that's what the guy has got. Now, his society, and that's the society really of all the Roman Empire, is of small people, small groups of people, each with their own gods and each with their own interests. A very, very busy place. Everybody's working very hard. It's a sort of society, in fact, that inevitably you're going to get people who are discontented in it. People who are running along and saying, why am I having to run so hard? Where am I going? There's a vacuum there. And in a sense, it's that vacuum which Paul is going to fill. He preached Christian love from the rooftops. And he got a big following. Not a majority, but enough in a couple of centuries so that the emperors themselves, realising the strange power of a religion that seemed to cement people into new alliance, would use it for the empire. It became the imperial religion, the Bible, the imperial book. So the story is then, how this arch, this great shrine, which for so many centuries had housed the gods, gods like this, and the pagan emperors themselves, ended up housing the Bible and the cross. Sunday morning, in one of the oldest churches in Rome, the Bible is carried to the high altar. This beautiful ritual is much older than the Christian church. Almost everything here, the great arch above the altar, the incense, the chanting, all have their origins in the court of the pagan Roman emperors. In those days, though, it was the emperors, the great persecutors of the Christians, and not the Bible that sat at the building center. Dicit ergo eis Jesus, amen, amen, dico vobis. These same pagan emperors put the Bible to work, part of their remedy for a failing government. They came down from the throne, joined the congregation and worshipped Jesus Christ. And they took the Bible and set it at the heart of their empire. And this 
was the beginning of the Bible's most extraordinary journey from ancient East to modern West. The Bible's journey started around 300 AD when the pagan emperor Diocletian, that most terrible of all the Christian persecutors, had ruled for about 20 years and was living here at Split in a huge palace on the Yugoslav coast. In Diocletian's time, when you came to see that great old emperor, as you walked through these palace gates and into the courtyard of the imperial audience chamber, you'd have been feeling very, very frightened. Diocletian wasn't a man, he was actually a god. And this is as near as you would have got to him. This really cathedral-like building is actually the courtyard of his palace. And that arch there in the middle, well, that's the focus of it all. Under that, he would have sat in his throne. You would have seen him because there'd have been great silk curtains hanging down. And there'd have been lots of other people waiting for the audience here. And I expect you'd have been shuffling a bit nervously. And then suddenly, from inside the royal apartments, which were the other side of that archway, you'd have heard the chinking of the soldiers as the emperor moved into his position. And then suddenly, as the chamberlain gestured, the curtains would go back, bang, and there would be the emperor, stiff as a board absolutely covered in white makeup, rigid on a golden throne. This beautiful silver plate shows it all. There's the emperor sitting under the arch, all wrapped up with a cloak of the finest purple silk, with clasps of gold, emeralds and pearls. All around him, a choir is singing of his heavenly power, and attendants hold flaming torches and waft incense all around the throne. All this ceremony, the Roman church would take for itself. This Diocletian wasn't only a god, he was an administrative genius. In 20 years rule, he completely reorganized the Roman Empire. When he started, it was in a terrible state. The army wasn't getting paid, nobody was paying their taxes, the whole place was disrupted. The Diocletian was a very moral man and he involved this new civil service with an amazing moral structure. He divided up his huge empire into brand new provinces, which he called dioceses. And to run them, he appointed administrators called vicars. And they wore robes just like those of modern priests. And they worked, Diocletian told them, for the good of the empire. Finally, Diocletian made more emperors, little Caesars, to help him administer this brand new empire. And the entire machine was built up around the image of imperial divinity. Naturally enough, any other universal religion inside the empire, one that wasn't centered on Diocletian, would be persecuted. This isn't because of some imperial ego trip. It's actually because it seemed to be attacking the very center of the structure which Diocletian had set up. One by one, lots of faiths were cut to pieces. In 302, it was Christianity's turn. The persecution was so severe and so sustained that some of the Eastern churches still actually date their calendar from the year of persecution rather from the birth of Jesus Christ. And many of our most famous legends of saints like St. George and things like this are actually legends of martyrdoms that took place in that time. But from the imperial side, all the records are completely gone. There's just one little letter of a magistrate from North Africa. It's a very interesting letter. It tells how he and his colleagues turned up at a little church in the Libyan countryside. And there they asked the church virgins who were in charge whether they would hand over the treasure, or you are dead men. So the vergers handed over their treasures. And then the magistrates wanted the center of the religion, the book, the Bible. Now these were kept on shelves outside the church, but the bookshelves were completely empty. 
Where were the books, the magistrates asked. Well, explained the Purgers, we've um, lent them to people, but we actually can't remember their names at the moment. And the magistrates then threatened them with death. And then the report goes that one of the Purgers got up and said, here we are, we are not traitors, kill us. Now, we don't know whether those men were killed or not, but just think of that. 1,600 years ago, in North Africa, a brave, lonely Christian, we don't even know his name, was protecting his Bible. But even gods got tired, it seemed. The work of running the huge empire exhausted Diocletian. That's why, in his old age, he built his palace as split, 